thank you everyone for coming uh, to today's library library live presentation. Uh, folks are still joining us, so you'll probably see that um, more and more people will be participating with us. Um, but we are very, very happy to have you here. My name is Iris Aceves. I am the lead coordinator at the Writing Wing of the Center for Academic Success. And as Leticia mentioned, uh, be, while we were getting ready, um, today's library live presentation is hosted in conjunction with the Center for Academic Success. We look forward to bringing um, some reading strategies uh, to all of you. This is a brand new presentation that the Center for Academic Success and the library have coordinated. Um, uh, a couple of times throughout the presentation, we will ask, um, you know, for for uh, collaboration with you. Uh, we'll ask questions. We'll hope that you'll have an opportunity to really engage with the work. Um, Leticia will also have an opportunity to um, send you some information. Um, so, and using a Padlet. Any information that you can give us to make this presentation better will be so, so helpful. You are, are the, you are the first individuals who are going to watch this presentation. We've spent many, many months on it, preparing for it. Um, and so any feedback that you can give us to make this presentation better for Cal State students uh, who will view it, the rest of the semester or even maybe next academic year will be so, so helpful. So once again, um, I am Iris, the lead coordinator at the writing wing of the Center for Academic Success, and I'm very happy to um, be here with Leticia. Leticia, take it away. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Leti Terrones. I'm a librarian at Cal State LA. And I really am so honored to partner with Iris today to bring to you a reading strategies workshop. It's so critical, so important to learn how to read with efficiency when you're in college because there's tons of reading to do. And a lot of it requires um, a type of attention that's very different from let's say reading um, a book for just for fun. So that's what we're gonna go over today. And like Iris said, I will be sending you information in the chat. Keep in mind that Library Live happens on Mondays and Thursdays. On Mondays, we do the session at 4.30. On Thursdays, we do the session at 11 a.m. And we repeat the same topic. So for instance, if you find that today's session was worthwhile, you got something out of it, please feel free to uh, share the info and the registration link with your friends. We will be sharing that at the end. Um, of the session today. So uh, without further ado, if you haven't um, yet filled out the, um, the poll that's over, that should be uh, visible to you now, please make sure to fill that out. Um, and I will be ending the poll in about a minute or so. Um, but I think we can go ahead and get started. So uh, take it away, uh, Iris. Uh, so once again, thank you for coming to reading strategies for college students. So what we're going to talk about today, so this is our, our agenda. We're going, to, uh, we're going to have a slide on reading and memory. We're going to talk about something called linear reading versus predatory reading. And we're going to work together to come up with that definition. What do we think predatory reading is all about? And then we're going to go ahead and give you all some tips for becoming a predatory reader. Um, and so these are actionable, six actionable tips that you could go ahead and take with you um, as the presentation is, is being conducted. So first of all, again, using that thumbs up feature, have you ever read an article, something that you've picked up from the library's database or maybe a chapter for homework and forgotten what it says within a few hours. So if, if this is sounds familiar to you all, um, Elizabeth, I'm seeing very brave thumbs up. Thank you, Lexa, thank you, Juan. Uh, thank you, Tracy and Wendy for the thumbs up. Yes, this happens very, very often that we are reading and we We've read all of these pages and we cannot remember what um, the information has told us. So first things first, in terms of reading and memory, 
as we can see from this quote, this is normal. Reading a whole bunch of work, reading journal articles, and then forgetting about what we read, that is actually normal. As we see in the, in the slide, um, after reading or listening to anything, your memory is going to gradually deteriorate 30% after nine hours and 20% after a week. So you will not actually remember a lot of things once you read them. And if you're distracted or you're tired or you're stressed out, your memory is even less reliable. Um, so this is something that we, number one, have to acknowledge when we're thinking about reading and memory and reading and taking notes. Because what I'd like to emphasize is that it's not actually your fault if you don't remember some of this, uh, what, if you don't remember some of the bits that you're reading, because your brain is actually created so that you don't remember everything, right? Uh, and there's some great scientific um, you know, uh, articles and, and stuff online and um, uh, that actually talk about the importance of forgetting. Um, but our whole point here in college is actually to remember. Uh, so in the next slide, we see um, that one of the readings, one of the reasons, and this information is coming to us from, uh, from, from uh, your toys essay, um, the transition to college writing. And actually I have it, I have a version here with me. Um, so one of the things that he says is that it is very normal for us to forget, um, it's very normal for us to, to forget. And the reason he argues that it's normal for us to forget is because of something called linear reading. And so linear, linear reading, as the word suggests, is reading from top to bottom, reading from the first word all the way to the last word. But there's also a couple of other things associated with linear reading. So in the chat feature, if it's possible, so this, um, this uh, uh, painting by Winslow Homer, Girl in the Hammock, actually gives us a little bit more information, visual information about linear reading. Um, could you all maybe tell me a little bit about what you see? So this is the interactive portion of the, the, the workshop. So can you see, can you tell me a little bit about what you see in terms of this person on a hammock? Um, what are some things that you are noticing? What does she have or does she not have? And as folks are jotting things down in the chat feature, Leticia, on my screen, I still see the poll. I'm not sure if that's supposed to still be there, but I'm going to look at the, the yes, I'm gonna look at the chat feature. Yes, she is very relaxed. Um, she has no phone. She is in a very relaxed posture. Thank you, Isabel. That's actually a really, really good um, uh, 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 note right there. She is in nature. Again, a lot of these things are very relaxed being in nature and very relaxed. I, I love that everyone's pointing out that she is very relaxed. It's just the person in the book. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you, Leticia. Um, one of the things that we are going to see it, that we see here, actually. So the thing we see here is that she is in a very relaxed position. I mean, thumbs up feature if you think that, hmm, this person is probably going to fall asleep while reading her book. Could we use a thumbs up feature too if, if folks are maybe thinking, yeah, she's going to fall asleep while reading this book? Yes, thank you, Alejandro. Thank you so much. The likelihood, and Ramon, Jocelyn, the likelihood that this young person falls asleep with the book just falling on top of her um, is, is actually quite likely. So that's another thing that we are seeing with linear reading, right? With linear reading, because you are super relaxed in linear reading, because you don't have a pencil, because you don't even, someone noted that this person didn't even have a phone with them. Maybe the phone is how you take notes, right? There is no pencil. There is no opportunity to take notes. They're in a very relaxed position where they're almost going to fall asleep. 
you know, all of those things are things that we think about in linear reading and specifically reading from beginning to end. And I see there's something else in the, Oh, <laughs> um, uh, thank you, um, thank you, Ramon. So we see that that these are these are some of the, the the pitfalls, as we can see, of linear reading. If you read from beginning to end, you probably won't finish the reading assignment, and especially if you're reading in that relaxed position, right, where you could easily fall asleep, right, you won't remember most of what you read. Uh, you won't have a record of what you understood while you read, because one of the things that you all pointed out was that she doesn't have a pencil, she doesn't have anything to take notes. And because she doesn't have anything to take notes, you won't immediately have responses for writing assignments that ask you to argue or interpret what you're reading, right? So this person in a very relaxed position, almost falling asleep, reading from the beginning of the book to the end of a book in a linear fashion. This is what we maybe think of as reading, but this is not the best way to read as college students, right? The best way to read as a college student is to become a predatory reader, right? So in the chat feature, we have this cartoon here of a, 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 some sharks and a book, right? And the only thing we have here again is become a predatory reader. So let's in the chat feature talk a little bit about what is a predator? What does a predator do? Um, why could we, <laughs> thank you, Emmanuel. I do love the fact that they're smiling as well. Um, uh, so, so, um, so, but what does a predator do, right? In terms of, of, yeah, they get prey. Thank you, Tracy. They get prey. They walk around and they're active. Oh, they hunt. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Ali, for mentioning that. They are attentive. Yes, they're going to go ahead and eat meat if they are predators um, and they're carnivorous predators. Survival. Oh my God, I love survival, Tracy. Goal oriented, aware of the surroundings. Focus, focus. Matthew, Michael, I want to grab focus and, and use that as, as a definition of a predatory reader. A predatory reader is focused, right? They're, they're on the alert. Oh, Vitus, I love that too. They're on the alert. A predatory reader is going to be someone who is focused and who is alert and is going to use the text to consume the text, right? To really grab what it is that he or she needs that they need in the reading. So a predatory reader is gonna consume the text. Predators, when you know they are going to eat their prey, um, they are actually going to eat the most important bits or the most important things that are gonna help them survive, right? If they have time, they'll eat everything, uh, other bits, but they wanna go ahead and focus on, you know, the most important things. And that's kind of what we want to talk about throughout this, this PowerPoint presentation, throughout this workshop with you. Yes, yes. Um, and so here is where we get to our actual, actual tips, right? We have six tips for you all to become a predatory reader. So, when you all are thinking, oh, I have all these essays to read, we don't want to be relaxed on a hammock, you know, no cell phone, no way to take notes. That will most likely not help you read all of the essays that you have to read. When you're reading for college, you want to kind of think about becoming a predatory reader, making sure that you're focused, like a couple of you said, making sure that you are um, oriented to looking specifically at what you need to survive, right? And so we've come up with the readings that Leticia and I were doing with some video presentations um, that we were looking at as well. We came up with six tips to share with you all. Um, yes, sorry, so Ramon, yes, thank you. Um, I, I, I was reading that and catching uh, up on, on that chat as well. So here is the six tips for becoming a predatory reader that we have for you. Tip number one is pick and choose the most important parts, right? And this is called the multiple reading process, right? So I'm gonna click on the chat feature to make 
sure ah that I am um, updated on, on what you all are saying. So when you get your article, right, you're going to go to library database, right? This actually also works with chapters of books, and it also works with uh, novels as well, right? Um, but we're going to use the example of a journal article for this particular presentation, right? So remember, linear reading is reading things from the first word all the way to the last word, right? But as a predatory reader, you don't want to do that. What you want to do is you want to go ahead and use the multiple reading process approach, which is that you first read the abstract, the introduction, and the conclusion. So you're going to read, the first time that you get this article, you're going to read the abstract, the introduction, and the conclusion first. And then, weirdly enough, you're gonna go in and read the headings. Because as you all are reading more and more, especially journal articles, you'll notice that journal articles have headings, the introduction, the methodology section, all of these, all of these uh, things, right? So you're going to go in after you read the abstract, the introduction, and the conclusion. You're going to go in and read the headings of everything and the topic sentences of all of these sections, right? And then you're actually going to read the entire text from beginning to end, that's the last thing you're ever going to do, right? So let's actually take a visual look at this, right? So in this uh, image that we have here, and uh, I did forget to mention, this tip comes from the LinkedIn Learning. So we all have access to LinkedIn Learning. Calcilla provides this to us free of charge as a Calcilla student. And this particular LinkedIn learning course is, um, thank you, Matthew, I agree. Uh, it is a very valuable resource. This particular LinkedIn learning uh, course is hosted by Paul Nowak, um, learning study skills. And he mentions this a lot. Um, so we see a visual representation. The first thing we're gonna read is the, the abstract, the introduction and the conclusion. And then you see in blue, the second thing that you read is actually the topic sentences of each of the paragraphs. And in that way, you end up reading parts of the journal article up to three times, right? Because first you're picking and choosing very specific things. And then if you decide, yes, I do actually need this article for my literature review or for my assignment, I do want to incorporate it. Um, then when you go back and you read the entire thing, you'll actually have read some of this information three times. And the great thing about the multiple reading process is that it helps you by starting off by reading the introduction, the, the abstract, the introduction, and the conclusion. It helps so that you, as you're reading the essay itself, um, you're not distracted by, oh, wait, I wonder what will happen next, right? you actually have an inkling of what the, the actual journal article is going to be about, right? So that was our first strategy. The second strategy is change your reading speed. So change your reading speed, right? So what do we mean by this? Once again, this is an idea from Paul Nowak. Um, and one of the things that he mentions is Make sure that the first sentence of every paragraph takes some time to read that slowly. And then you can go ahead and read everything else at, at the normal pace that you read, right? But read the first sentence of every paragraph slowly or really take your time to understand it because a topic sentence um, or the first sentence of every paragraph, not always, um, and as... Um, we can see in on the left hand side, um, the information is usually in that first sentence. So if you really understand the first sentence, you'll have a better understanding of the paper itself of the journal article itself, right. So we're going to go ahead and read I'll read this bit uh, on the left hand side out loud. And I'll try to um, enact it a little bit right slow down when reading the first sentence of each paragraph. Slow down when reading the first sentence of each paragraph. Topic sentences tend to focus on the main idea of the paragraph. 
Don't miss the main idea by reading the entire paragraph at the same speed. This tip comes from Paul Nowak's Learning Studies Skills course in LinkedIn Learning. He says maybe 80% of the time or more the first sentence of the main idea of the paragraph is the main idea of the paragraph. So it's important to slow down here to make sure you don't miss that important sentence. So as I read that sample paragraph, it gave us a lot of information, but the main point was slow down when you read the first sentence, uh, the, sorry, the, uh, slow down when you read the first sentence of each paragraph, right? So everything else just gave you support um, to why that first sentence is accurate or is the tip, but the tip itself, the strategy itself is to slow down when we read the first sentence of every paragraph. So let's go over to our third strategy. Um, observe word choice. Um, and actually in the chat feature, if I'm going too quickly, let me know. Um, that will actually also help us um, when we do this presentation again, if we decide, oh, Iris can't slow down enough to do all six um, skills. Maybe she just needs to only put four in. Um, you know, th that will help us. Um, so, so if that is happening with anyone, uh, let us know in the chat feature directly as a private message to Leticia or, or as a group message. Um, but it looks like we are, are doing really well. Uh, so the tip uh, strategy number three is observe word choice. And what do we mean by this, right? So here, one of the things Leticia and I did is that we took a, a, an actual article that is on, available on JSTOR. Um, it is, as you can see from the, at, the, at the bottom of the slide here, um, it's coming out of the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. So what we did is that we, we got the introduction, two paragraphs from the introduction, and that's what you're seeing here. You don't have to read the whole slide. That's not the point. The point here is that there are always key words where the author is actually highlighting or giving you in, uh, the information to let you know, okay, as the author of this journal article, this is the whole reason why I wrote it, right? This is my thesis in this journal article, right? So let's look at the word choices and those word choices are in bold. The rest of the text is in, um, like a, a, a lighter black or gray. So this is, this is what they've written. In this article, we reiterate. And then later on they say, we suggest. And then at the first sentence, remember this is actually a tip that Paul Nowak gave us uh, a couple of, of um, strategies ago, right? Again, the first sentence of the next paragraph, our hypothesis is, so there are key words that the authors of journal articles uh, will, will use to give you as a reader a hint or um, uh, some information about what the thesis is. So remember when our teachers were our professors ask us to write a paper, they say, make sure you have a strong thesis because there should be a purpose to why you're writing this, right? Well, for, um, for, for folks to uh, also write a journal article and have it published, they also have to have a purpose, right? Very often they won't use the word thesis, but we see here they are actually using our hypothesis is, right? And they're also giving us this clues with the word we suggest. Like, I think that my thesis is going to be this, right? Uh, so in the, the purpose of this particular slide is to show you that it might actually not look like people are helping you, the authors are helping you, um, because they have so much text. So as a predatory reader, zone in on words that are kind of like equal signs to where the thesis is. So let's go ahead and look at a couple of more of those words, right? So this list of words comes from a book um, by Gerald Graff and Kathy Brickenstein. The title of the book is They Say, I Say. This is a really, really great resource if you all have this available. Um, but, but if you don't, um, this is the list of words that they, that they suggest are the verbs, 
and that's very important. These are the verbs that authors will use to tell you where their thesis is, right? So those verbs are argue, assert, believe, we claim, I want to emphasize, uh, we insist, um, the, the researchers observed X, Y, and Z, right? Um, you know, remind us, report, suggest. So this is a list of, of sample verbs that uh, Gerald Graff and Kathy Birkenstein suggest are things that a predatory reader should be using when reading journal articles, right? Um, and so we see as an example um, it from our, our essay that we're using as a sample, they actually use one of these words, right? We didn't make this up, but you know, um, this, is, this is information by Gerald Graff and Kathy Birkenstein. And then we compared it to the article that Leticia and I are using. And in that article by Angela Duckworth, um, one of the sentence, sentences, one of the sentences is, these findings suggest that the achievement of difficult goals entails the sustained and focused application of talent over time. Right. Uh, this is this is an article on grit and how it's important that we develop a sense of grit so that we can achieve uh, uh, and, and make sure that we we attain our goals. Right. Uh, and so in the list is the word suggests. And in the essay, the in the actual real life essay, um, the uh, Angela uh, Angela Duckworth and and the rest of the folks who wrote the article actually do use the word suggest. So this is something to keep in mind as you're reading. If you're like, oh my god, you know, there's so many words here, I don't know which one. Kind of focus on these verbs. If you, when you are looking for what the thesis of the article is or what the purpose of the article is, right? Um, and so let's go on to our fourth, um, uh, our fourth, fourth strategy. And the fourth strategy is one that you all have heard very often to annotate, which in other words is just take notes, right? So, in terms of taking notes, so we had one of our tutors, um, you know, in, in so uh, as you all uh, might know, um, as lead coordinator at the writing wing of the Center for Academic Success, I work with the writing tutors on campus um, and uh, uh, they help Cal State students when they are working on, on papers. So in conversations with one of my tutors, um, we were talking about, you know, what does, what does notes look like, what, you know? Uh, and so she was very kind enough to give us uh, a picture, to take a picture of, you know, one of her notes and, uh, and let us have that for this particular presentation, right? So this is, this is something that, you know, she has copied um, from a textbook. So some of the tips that we're using here, even though we're really focusing on journal articles, um, you know, you could also adapt these to chapters in a book. And so that's what we're seeing here. And let's take a look at the paper itself, at the photo of the notes, right? We have that it's week two at the very top, right? So we're seeing that she's using her syllabus to figure out, okay, when am I supposed to read this? When am I supposed to read that, right? And in taking notes, there are a lot of notes on the side, right? So when you take notes, Take notes on the side of the paper if you have a hard copy. We're gonna talk about the digital stuff in a second. So if you have a hard copy, take notes on the side margin, right? Um, these notes could be definitions of words, uh, especially if it's new vocabulary and that definition is not actually incorporated into the body of the paper. Um, also a quick par paraphrasing or a quick summary of what some of the sections say, right? So we look at this picture of, you know, this, um, of this chapter from a book, and we see that in this whole first page, there are only two paragraphs. Um, so these are rather long paragraphs. So if you wanted to, with a single sentence say, okay, this paragraph is about blah, 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 then you can, that, those are the notes that you can go ahead and take on the side. Um, 
And so uh, I see that, that Leticia is answering some of the questions here. So I'll go ahead and continue with the, with the next slide, right? Another thing about taking notes is to highlight wisely, right? So I, um, very often, I think, you know, some of us think like, okay, I, I have a highlighter, that means that I'm taking notes. But in actuality, that is a passive way of taking notes, right? So once again, uh, Paul Nowak suggests that when you're taking, when you're taking notes, specifically when you're highlighting, read the paragraph first. And then in your mind or on the notes on the side, figure out, okay, what's this paragraph trying to tell me? And then when you figure out what the paragraph is trying to tell you, then highlight that word or lines that actually tell you what it is that you should remember, right? Because again, if you read the paragraph first or the page first, and then you go back to figure out what are the most important parts of it, that will um, make you a more predatory reader, a more active reader than by going from the first word all the way to the last word. Um, because in that way, you're reading linearly and you don't know what is coming up next. So every new sentence feels like, oh my God, this is such a great sentence. I have to underline it. And then the next sentence feels like it's another great sentence that you have to underline. But in reality, you want to look at the, the um, paragraph, if you want to go paragraph by paragraph, or the, the whole page, you want to look at all of that first, and then go in and either highlight wisely or take good notes on the side, right? Um, the, the, I mentioned briefly that if, you know, the, those were images of our tutor who had uh, images of, of a notes that our tutor had lent us for this particular presentation. But um, if you don't have a hard copy of something, there is a way that you can take notes um, through a digital medium. So as the, um, the, the orange bar at the bottom says, there are comment features on Microsoft Word. And if you have a PDF of something, you can always click the edit PDF or comment PD, a comment section in the PDF, and it'll turn your, your digital copy of the, your reading into something that looks like this, where you can see uh, our tutor Noel's notes on the side right here, uh, uh, on, the, on the side. And so, you know, you don't have to like photocopy every single thing, especially now that we're not on campus where we don't have easy access to a photocopy machine, right? Okie dokie. So this takes us to the second to last um, uh, bit that we have. We are doing really, really good time. Um, and sorry, really quick, Jace, I think the question was, how do you do this thing about the digital annotation? Yeah, that's what I'm, uh, yeah, that's like game changing right now. <laughs> yep. So then what you do is that when you download your, your PDF, right, or, or the whatever paper you're going to read. Um, so, so then um, when you download it on the left hand side, it'll say something like comments with PDF or, or open up the comments or edit PDF. And it'll open up a little um, bar, like a column on the right hand side and you can click on comments. And there's also some stuff on the top where you can comment and you can highlight on the PDF as well, right? Um, and so that is probably, um, that's not the most technical way of explaining it, um, but you could always check so out some YouTube videos to show no, you how to make comments on. That was great, thank you, thank you. I'm gonna definitely do that right now because I have to do research, so wonderful. Okay, super, thank you, thank you, Chase. Okay. <laughs> And so, so let's go on to the, our second to last um, bit of information. And at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Leticia. Uh, and Leticia is gonna to talk to us about creating concept maps. Okay, yes. So simply a concept map is a visual uh, representation of how you're putting information together. Um, in the next slide, um, we, um, can, we have an example. Um, of what a concept map can look like. And there's a lot of different ways of doing it. So what we did for to make our concept map, um, oh, uh, part, 
is we use that article that uh, Iris uh, just showed, the GRID article. Yes. So um, what we did with it is we pulled the following items from it. And in a second, as soon as I'm done um, sort of talking, I'm going to share this very handout that we can see on the next slide. Uh, the next slide. Yes. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, thank you, Iris. Okay, so this slide, um, I actually, you know, I borrowed it from um, a friend of mine um, who is taking classes uh, as a doctoral student with um, with uh, uh, at the University of Illinois, and her main advisor is um, Professor Moody uh, in anthropology. And one of the things that um, Professor Moody recommended to my friend is to look for any number of these eight different things as you're reading. Um, and so when we did our concept map, we only picked like four of these things. The main one that you everybody should be looking for is where in the article or where in the book chapter or where in the, you know, in the book um, is the author making the main argument. Mm -hmm. Um, when you find the main argument, that's a very important thing to highlight and even annotate. The way I usually do it is on the side, when I find the argument, I'll literally put the word argument so that when I go back to it, I know exactly what part of the reading has that important claim. Because keep in mind that researchers and scholars, uh, one of the main things that we do is that we observe phenomenon and then we say something about it. The, the part where we're saying something about it, that's our argument. Now we have to back it up. We can't just be making claims out of nowhere. So the evidence part, that's another important aspect of when you're annotating and reading pred with predatory eyes is to identify where in the article are the authors presenting the evidence for the stuff that they're making a claim about. The other things in here are things that, for instance, surprised you about what they're saying or things that um, kind of confirmed your ideas like, oh, yeah, we had talked about that in class. So this article reminded me of that. It confirms something that I already knew. Um, an area where you might be curious about learning more. Wow, I've never I had never heard about that concept or that uh, argument is very striking to me. I'm curious to learn more about it. That's another aspect about predatories, right? Because when you're a predator, you're always, like we were saying earlier, on the lookout. One of your jobs at Cal State LA is to begin directing, especially as you're an upper division student, begin directing the kinds of ideas and like, um, I guess like trajectories or avenues that you're taking for further investigation. An area where you need help, highlight that part and write the word help so that you can go back either to like writing center, to the tutoring center or to the library. You can always reach out to me or to the library chat and say, you know, I need help understanding this particular part. Can you provide some uh, help for me either in terms of resources, et cetera, or a part that might be confusing to you or a part that you wish to connect to something else that you're learning. In a second, I'm gonna share the Word document um, that has these tips laid out. Okay, so I think now we're at the visual parts, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, so um, this concept map on the left-hand side, you'll see that we just like grab the abstract from the article and cut and paste it. So that when I kind of come back to my notes, I have the abstract, which tells me in a nutshell, what is the, what is the article about? What are they arguing? How did they do their research? What methods did they use? Um, what did they find when they did their study? And what sort of recommendations do they give? And then on the right-hand side, I kind of put those parts down, argument, evidence, something that was confirmed for me or, or an area that was confusing for me. And I just kind of added my own sort of notes on that side. And at the bottom, I um, cut and pasted the, um, the MLA um, citation. Of course, if you're working with APA, you could do the same. The following examples are just the same idea, um, but just sort of visually in a different sort of way. Um, so we highly recommend that you use this idea of concept mapping because then um, you can have these notes in a way where you've done the predatory reading, 
then you've done another process of remembering because now you've written them down. And then sort of like the third process of remembering is sort of like this trick for memory. Sometimes they're called mnemonics where you make a little story or some sort of visual that connects to that information. So you can say, oh yeah, I remember I used the donut concept map for talking about that article. So then you'll remember back to the things that you wrote down in the concept map. Okay, I think that's it. I'm gonna um, unmute and I'm gonna share that handout. And Leticia, as you are unmuting uh, or you're, you're putting the, the mute button on, and sharing the handout. Some of these concept maps, I'll, I'll go back to, to the first one. Um, they're very fancy. Um, do we have to do a concept map that's this fancy? Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, okay, well, of course, we want to make the presentation appealing, right? So I just use Canva, canva.com. And they have all kinds of templates that are already made. I'll share the link in there as well. But a concept map doesn't have to be fancy. It could simply be a piece of paper, a notebook paper, where you circle, make a circle in the middle, and you put argument in the middle, and then you make these little lines that offshoot to show, okay, this is the evidence. This is the part where I'm a little bit confused. This is the, um, the part where they gave the recommendation in the article. Any sort of offshoots that come from the center, um, which would be the main argument. So a concept map can look however you want it to look. I just use these fancy, you know, Canva templates to make it um, appealing or catching to the eye. Thank you. I, I do appreciate this last one with, with the donut. I, you know, I, <laughs> I, it's very fun. So, so this brings us to um, our, our last tip. Um, and this last tip, again, um, is just going back to this idea that we're going to be looking at whatever we're reading, either a journal article, um, a, a book, a chapter of a book, and we really want to make meaning from the reading, as we can see from, from the tip. So we want to situate this in the context of the class. So why am I reading this particular essay in my child development class, right? What is that going to bring to me, right? Um, another, in terms of making meaning from the reading, another thing that we mean by that is talk about the essays with your classmates and teach the essays to each other, right? So especially if you create um, small groups in your, in, in your class or for your major, or you um, came into the program as part of a cohort and you know, you're seeing like the same person over and over and over again in your child development courses or in your social, um, social work courses or in your sociology or anthropology classes, if you're seeing folks over and over again, you might want to reach out and try to create uh, some study groups with folks, right? Um, so in that way, you will have an opportunity to really talk about the essays with each other. So specifically, we see from, again, we, we, are, um, we are using as many resources as we possibly could in order to create this presentation for folks. And this one specifically comes from Dr. Dr. Jonathan Rosa. Um, he is at Stanford University. And so what he suggests is that before someone starts to read a book or an article or, or, or something along those lines, um, you know, maybe um, learn about the author, right? One of the reasons that, one, one of the really great reasons about choosing the GRIT article, um, the, the Angela Duckworth GRIT article, is because she has a couple of TED Talks. Uh, associated with her whole concept of grit, and she has an actual um, book associated with that. So for some of us who really get information and understand information better when we're actually seeing it, the, the, the last suggestion here, the last strategy is that maybe when you get um, a book that you have to read or a, a journal article that you have to read, maybe Google on YouTube or on TED Talk, um, the author or the authors, right? And maybe they're going to go ahead and talk about some of these things. And in that way, you get some more information about what that author is all about, what that researcher is all about, what, they, what do they stand for? And 
connect that, right? And, and so see where that piece fits in the broader body of work, right? Where does this particular article or author or researcher fit in the whole concept of child development or social work or anthropology, right? Um, because in that way, you'll have an opportunity to, to really anchor and understand where the readings are coming from. So that these are not just random readings that your professor is giving you and you're like, oh, I don't know, I'm reading this because my teacher told me and I don't really know how they fit in my major. What you want to go ahead and do is really start to connect the articles or the readings that you get in class or even the things that you research and connect them with this larger idea, right? And so this is what we see in the second to last, um, uh, second to last slide that we have here, right? This idea that every, every article maybe here and every, and every person who's reading an article, they're all interconnected, right? So you'll have authors that pop up a lot, right? Um, you know, if, if you are learning about um, the development of children in uh, child development, you, or maybe even in the Charter College of Education, if you're there, like you have to know who Piaget is, right? Um, this, is, this is like a key person who pops up, a researcher that pops up over and over and over again, right? Um, so connect some of, ideally all, but at least connect some of your required reading to everything else that is happening in the class. How does chapter two fit with everything else that I'm going to be reading in the class, right? Or how do these chapters fit with everything else that I'm reading in the class? If you're creating a, uh, a literature review, if you're writing a literature, a literature review for your criminal justice course, right? And you think about the topic, how do all of these articles relate to this topic, right? So really have a conversation with the reading. And that's also going to make the reading a little bit easier to understand and to digest, right? So um, this brings us to uh, the, the, uh, the last slide that we have, which is these are all of the, the resources that we used to create this PowerPoint presentation. And we thank you very, very much for your participation. We have 10 minutes for Q&A. Let me go ahead and stop the share feature. Um, I just wanna say thank you guys for putting this on. Um, this is super helpful because like I'm doing research like literally right now. Like, <laughs> so it's very, you know, it's so timely. So I, I just wanna thank you guys for that. Thank you so much, Jace. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to uh, give some encouraging words to you and to everybody, you know, um, reading in college and reading, you know, academic stuff, reading uh, like, you know, with predatory eyes. Um, it's difficult, you know, it's not a relaxing thing, unfortunately, like that picture that we saw in the beginning. Um, but the more that you put into it, um, the better you're going to get at it. And it becomes sort of um, like a second nature, you know, um, how to approach your readings. So keep in mind that, you know, these academic articles that you have to read for a literature review, sometimes they're 30 pages long. And just like staring at it feels like, oh my gosh, impossible. So keep in mind, you don't have to read it from the very beginning all the way to the end. Instead, keep in mind that you have those words to look out for that academic articles will usually tell you what they're talking about, what their main argument is. In that very first or second paragraph, they're gonna lay it out for you. This is what we're arguing. And then the second section, usually if it's written in APA style, the second section of the article will say methods or methodology. That's where right. they're gonna tell you, we surveyed 30 people. We um, conducted oral histories. We did a close reading. There's all kinds of different ways to do research. The methods is where they're gonna tell you how, what kind of method did they use to do the research. Someone just shared in the chat that you can also use the Pomodoro method, which means um, that you work in like 20 minute chunks or 30 minute chunks. That way, if you have like a whole hour to study, to do your schoolwork, you could kind of break it up 
um, into little pieces of time so that um, you, be, you begin to build up kind of like the muscles for uh, staying on longer, like 40 minutes longer, or, you know, uh, 50 minutes of study. They say that truly humans, um, we can only really do deep work for about four hours total. So um, figure out what time is the best time for you during the day. Do you work best at the nighttime? Do you work best early in the morning? You know, because then um, you want to do like the hardest work when your mind is the sharpest. Um, there was a question about um, ADHD. The POMO um, method might be good. And I'm going to put right here the link to the POMO focus, the POMO um the Pomodoro uh, sort of website that I use. Um, so this is the one that me and my friends that um, are also working on their PhDs. Um, this is the one that we do, Pomo Focus. And uh, you could also uh, buddy up, you know, with uh, your friends to say, okay, everybody um, make a Zoom, you know, and then share the link with your buddies and then say, okay, what is everybody's goal? Uh, for the next um, 30 minutes of Pomo Focus. Everybody puts down their goals. You put it on silent, you put it on mute, but you're accountable to each other. That means no checking your phone, no going on Twitter, no da 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 You just get down right to it and you work together for 30 minutes. And believe it or not, those 30 minutes add up. You know, it's very helpful to have somebody there that you're accountable to, you know, whether you have your camera on or off, um, but you're working together. Are there any more questions? And Leticia, as you are, are putting that information up in the chat feature, one of the things that I did is I found the link um, to, to actually get some help from peer students who also work in the library. So you're always welcome to visit the writing tutors at the Center for Academic Success. But if researching is the focus of a particular um, you know, writing assignment that you have to begin uh, to begin to gather information, there are student research consultants at the library. And so I put the information from the library webpage so that you all can access them, but they uh, are accessible on the main library's webpage. There's a little chat widget. Um, and so in that chat feature, you can ask questions and the student research consultants are, are there answering questions as well. I'm gonna share my screen real quick. So you could kind of see like um, what from that subject librarian and then also what Iris was mentioning about the student consultants. So you can kind of see um, how to find them, okay? Okay, calstatela.edu slash library, right? This is our main website. This is like a big important part right here because all of our most important info, like how to access the library, you know, right now during pandemic times, all of this stuff is located right here if you wanna sign up for more library live. Now, another very important place is right here where it says research. Under research, I'm going to click on research help librarians link. And if you click there, um, as you roll down, you're going to see who the um, librarians are. So for example, if you're taking a class in arts and letters, your primary librarian is this person, Scott Breveld, uh, my friend and my colleague. For English, uh, Peja Stuhoff, Liberal Studies, Sarah Baker. And you'll notice that um, everybody is listed according to their college and you have their email address right here. So like our business um, librarian, uh, Jen Mazunaga, also uh, Michael Germano is another business librarian. You could just send us a direct email. Okay, now to get help with, um, with a student, the fastest way to do it is on every single web page of the library, we have this little icon, this little chat bubble. And when you click right there, it sends an automatic um, instant message. So all you do is put your name right there, you put your email address and you say, um, I have a question about blah, 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 blah. Um, are there any questions at this point? We've shared a lot of information. Um, and just uh, remember, you know, that you're not alone in this, um, in this journey of higher education. It's arduous. It's hard. You know, you have to put in some blood, sweat and tears, but it's so worth it. And you have lots of help. So don't be afraid to reach out. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Okay. Thank you, Thank you everyone.
Bye, everyone.